Jim said, we had a very interesting class learning more about the word Christian broadcasting. This is Andy Baker, and he is the president and CEO of Word Christian Broadcasting, and he has served for 24 and a half years. He has also served in churches in Kentucky and Tennessee for more than 40 years, and he's worked with a hospice organization for 20 years. <clears throat> in addition to studying Bible and receiving both an Associates of Arts degree from Fried Hardeman <coughs> and Bachelor of Arts from David Lipscomb University. He studied healthcare administration and received a Master of Health Arts from the University of Kentucky. He and his wife Susan is currently, they currently live in Thompson Station. And they have a son and a daughter, Matthew Baker and Andrea Baker Mills. And we're, of course, we're excited to have y'all today and uh, we're going to learn more about Christian broadcasting and we hope to continue supporting you. So, turn it over to you, Mr. Baker. I think I've been explained to you as well. You said just about everything going on with me. It's an honor to be with you today. I appreciate Tom and Brenda coming from our home church today. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you. I've never been here, been here once in my life. And it's good to be back with you on this Lord's Day morning. Let's have a Bible check. Hold them up. No songbooks. You can't hold songbooks up. If you have those unspiritual cell phones and, and iPads, you can use those for sure. I want you to study with me and have your Bibles open because we're going to study one page of the text. This passage was just read in Acts 16 is where we're going to be. So would you get your Bibles and would you get your iPhones and your iPads to the book of Acts chapter number 16. Everybody loves a story. Anybody in this room love a story? We're going to talk about three stories today. The third one is my most favorite of the three we'll talk about. I'm going to go, Caleb read from verse number 6 through verse number 10, that they wanted to go down and preach the gospel in a couple of weird city names, but they were not allowed to do that because the Holy Spirit prevented them from doing that. Paul and his companions were being very, very effective in teaching good news about Jesus. Go back to verse number 1 beginning of chapter 16, which sets the tone for the first story we're going to talk about. He came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. Him would Paul have to go forth with him and, took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. As they went through the cities, they delivered them the, the, the decrees for to keep that were ordained by the apostles and elders which were in Jerusalem. And the number and, were, and so were the churches established in the faith and encouraged in numbers daily. Look in verse number 5. Paul and his companions were being very, very successful in teaching the good news about Jesus. Had a lot of folks that were obeying the gospel. And the text said in verse number 5 that the churches were increased in faith and they grew in numbers. Sounds like a pretty good church, pretty good work going on in all these churches. And Paul and his companions were being very, very effective. Well, then you come to chapter 16 in verse 6, as we just read a moment ago. They wanted to go down in a couple of places and preach the gospel. Let's reread it just for emphasis sake. Paul and his companions, verse number 6, had gone throughout Phrygia, the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Now, wait a minute. These were two of the most successful preachers in the brotherhood back at that time. And they wanted to go down and preach at a certain place. And the Holy Spirit said no. I wonder why. Let's keep reading together in the text again. Look at verse 7. And they, when they came to Mycenae, they essayed to go into Bithynia. But the Spirit suffered them not. They wanted to go down and preach at another place. And God's Holy Spirit said, no. Now these are Paul and his companions were being very, very successful. <coughs> Let's look up to verse 5. They're being very, very successful in teaching the good news. Church is growing. It's growing in faith in numbers. And God would not let them go down and preach a couple of different places. And again, my question is, why would not God want these successful preachers to go down and teach the good news? Let's keep reading in the text. Look in verse number 10. Or verse number, verse number 9. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. 
There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go to Macedonia and assuredly gathered that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. The great Macedonian call. What was the call? Would you come down here and help us? If the Lord had allowed them to go to those other couple of cities to preach, they would have missed what? <coughs> they would have missed the Macedonian call. They would have missed exactly where God wanted them to be. Where did God want them to be? Down in Macedonia. I need your eyes here for a second. Have you ever wondered maybe in your life maybe why the Lord kept maybe some things from happening that you really wanted to make happen? Could it be that the Lord really wanted you to be in another situation? Maybe you wanted this house, but it didn't work out and you moved to this house. Could it be that that would have maybe God directed so you would meet that neighbor across the back fence? Or be in that particular neighborhood to meet someone to tell them about Jesus? Or maybe you wanted to date that girl. And the one that you wanted to date, it just kept closing those doors. And a door opened up with another girl. Same way with that boyfriend that you really wanted to have. Could it be that maybe... The job you now have, you really wanted another job. Could it be that the job you now have is the very one God opened up those doors for you? I need some head now. Does that, does that make sense? Maybe you didn't get what you wanted. Maybe you ended up in another situation because that's exactly where God really wanted you to be. Would you rather serve God with good health or bad health? I'll take good health any day. But can you serve God with that? With Even with bad health, you certainly can opportunities that God sends our way, He does so because that's exactly where He wants us to be. I don't know you personally. I don't know what's going on in your life or what has been going on in your life. But I want you to realize that maybe some of the things that occur in life are not just accidents. Maybe they're not bad things that occur. It could be that God is getting you where He wanted you to be. And we have to be open to that. Head nodding time. Does that make sense? That's one story. We need to be pleased where we are. Maybe God has placed it. Maybe the, the co-worker that's obnoxious, maybe the Lord has put you in contact with that person so you can really show them what it's like to be like Jesus. Second story begins in verse number 11. I want you to follow this story with me and see if you don't see God's hand working in this. Verse number 11 beginning. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis. And from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony. And we were in that city abiding certain days. On the Sabbath day, on the Sabbath we went out to the city by the riverside, where prayer was wont to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which were, which were resorted thither. Paul and his companions go down to the beach on the Sabbath day, and they're going to have a worship. They're going to have a time of prayer. And while they're at the place that they decided to sit along that seashore, there were ladies also gathered for a time of prayer. Look with me, if you will, in verse number 14. A certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened. I want you to circle that at least in your mind, if so in your Bibles. Here is Lydia, and she's learning about Jesus, and the text says... A certain woman, Lydia, which worshiped God, heard it, whose heart the Lord opened. Whose heart the Lord opened. And she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized, and her household. Well, now, wait a minute. We've got a place they chose to go down to the beach. And there's some ladies there wanting to pray with them. And they have a Bible study. And the text says that God moved Lydia's heart. And when he moved her heart, she was baptized into Christ. I'm going to tell you a story on me that I'm embarrassed to tell. When I was a young, young preacher just a few years ago, <laughs> when I was a young, young preacher, I used to think if I could tell it just right and explain it just right, that I could baptize anybody. Because I thought I had the ability of persuasive words and good timing to be able to communicate to others and they would want to be baptized. I thought I was really an ingredient in folks coming to the Lord. Let me tell you a story that happened that changed my thinking. When you go to Free Hardeman College for the lectureships, you don't get any rest, do you? You don't sleep and you're visiting with your buds and eating crazy food. I spent a week at Free Hardeman Lectures and I came back to Kentucky where we were living at the time. 
had a preach that morning, did the Bible class that morning, and I had a Bible study that afternoon with a lady from Columbia, Tennessee, using the Jewel Miller film strips. How many remember the Jewel Miller film strips? Y'all don't remember, y'all don't know what I'm talking about, do you? You need to ask these folks that raised their hand what those Jewel Miller film strips were all about. They were films that you put in a machine and you turned the knob to change the slide, and it was time to change the slide when what happened? when there was a little ding, a little beam. I'm in the middle of this Bible study. Remember, I hadn't slept in a week. And I'm hearing the ding, and it changes the slide. And I'm over here going, <laughs> but I'm staying awake as that beep makes, you know, reminds me to wake up. We get to the end of that Bible study, and guess what? I had slept through half of it, and this lady <coughs> wanted to be baptized. What did I learn? Make is not about you. It's the Lord that changes the hearts of people. It's the Lord that moves in people's hearts to bring them to obedience. Go back to the text. Read it again. A certain woman named Lydia, seller, verse 14, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, and she attended unto the things that were, that were spoken of Paul. When she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If you judge me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And they did. It's not about us. It's the Lord that moves people's hearts to obedience. I need some head nodding. Does that make sense? It's not about how well we tell it. It's not how good we tell it. It's not how thorough we tell it. It's not how scholarly we may sound. The Lord is the one that moves people's hearts to obey the gospel. I don't know where you are in your journey with God. There may be those in this very room that would love to be baptized into Christ today. But I would encourage you to allow the Lord to move your heart, move your mind, to decide to become obedient to the gospel. Story one, they didn't go down to, to these two places to preach because God wanted them to be at another place. Maybe God's working in your life and my life just like that. Second story, it's not about us. It's not how good we tell the story. It's the Lord that's moving the hearts of people to obedience. Third story is my favorite. We're in the city of Philippi. From your past Bible studies, what's the thing that stands out to you that you remember about Philippi? The jailer. Remember that story about the jailer? That's my third story. Here's what I want you to notice. I want you to notice how God orchestrated this whole conversion story. In chapter 16, verse 16 beginning, we're going to read how God used this. He, 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 he orchestrated this whole thing we're about to read about. By morning, by, by morning daylight, we're going to have breakfast. Right before the breakfast, we're going to dry, get into dry clothes because somebody's going to be baptized. Well, before that, we're going to have a Bible study. Well, before that, we've got to get the teacher in with the jailer, and we're going to have an earthquake. We got to get those guys in trouble with the with the police so they can be thrown in prison to be able to have access to the to the jailer. I want you to notice how God orchestrated this entire thing. Read with me, beginning in verse 16. Came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Let's put this in everyday talk. You got a girl that's able to predict the future, and you got some guys making money off of that. You got some guys that's making money off her ability to predict the future. Verse 17. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And she did this for many days. Let's make that practical. Here's a woman that's talking all the time. And she's saying some good things, but she's saying it so often and so loud, Paul gets tired of listening to it. So look what happens. In verse 18, But Paul, being grieved, and turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Verse 19, When her master saw what had happened, when they saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace and to the rulers, brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Romans. Multitudes rose up against them. Magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safe. 
before we can have this Bible study in jail, what had to happen? They had to get in trouble with the officials, and they did. They were, and, and it's kind of interesting how this whole thing came to be. The guys making money off the girl turned them in. These guys are causing trouble. They're causing havoc in our city. And they got put in jail. God's going to orchestrate this whole thing. First thing they had to do was get the guys in trouble with the police, and they did. And now they're in jail, and now they have an opportunity to meet the jailer. <coughs> number 24, if you will. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Picture that scene. This is a, this is a bad, bad man. We're going to put him on the, in the inner jail. We're going to put chains on his feet so he won't escape. Here's, this is a bad, bad person. Paul and Silas are there. They're in jail. Look what happens in verse 25. At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. I bet you this jailer had heard all kinds of words and all kinds of things being a jailer. I wonder if he'd ever heard anybody praying. Well, Paul and Silas are in the, in the jail. It's midnight. They're praying, and they're singing praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Well, who has heard them? The jailer. I pause up here for a second. You never know who's watching you live your life. You never know who's listening. When we lived in Danville, Kentucky, I had a Sunday morning radio program. Um, I didn't know that the, the, the disc jockey was listening. Did, did programs for several years. I didn't know that the disc jockey was listening. After one of the broadcasts one day, he said, I'd like you to baptize me into Christ. I had no clue that the, the, the guard, that the disc jockey, was listening to my lessons. You never know. Somebody in this room has somebody that thinks you're the neatest person that's ever lived. You may have grandkids in the room. Well, they think you're pretty neat. You never know who's watching. You never know what co-worker is watching you live your life. You never know in the, in the lunchroom or in the coffee break room somebody noticing that you didn't laugh at the dirty joke that was told. Somebody could be watching you. Could it be that somebody thinks you're just the neatest person that's ever lived? This jailer's been listening to Paul and Silas. Let's let God orchestrate just a little bit further. Verse number 26. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison awakened out of his sleep. Seeing the prison doors open, he threw out his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing the prisoners had been fled. Why was he going to kill himself? If you're a guard and, you're, and your prisoners escape, they kill you. So instead of letting them do it, he's going to do it himself. Here's the jailer reacting to this whole event. Have you noticed what God, the orchestration that God did? We got the guys in trouble to get them in the jail. They're singing and they're praying. We have an earthquake. Let's see what happens next. Had the earthquake in verse 28. Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Don't hurt yourself, do no harm, for we are all here. He called for a light, sprang in and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You never know who's watching you. You never know who's listening and watching your life. The jailer said, I want you to tell me more about this salvation thing. I want you to tell me more of what, what do I need to do to be saved. In verse 31, first thing he was told to do was to believe the message. Here's someone who just heard messages maybe for the very first time. What do I need to do? He was told you need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He went on to teach him some more things because we realized by morning light, he was baptized, Luke in 33. Took in the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. The Lord orchestrated this entire thing. We had breakfast in my morning time. Right before the breakfast, we changed into some dry clothing. Right before that, we had a baptism. Before the baptism, we had an earthquake. Or we had a Bible study. Before that, we had an earthquake. Before that, we got Paul and Silas in trouble with the, with the officials, and they got cast into, into jail. Nod your head with me. You see how God orchestrated that whole thing? God is involved in the whole thing. I wonder what he's doing in your life and mine. I bet you some of us in this room think that God's sure got a sense of humor for what he's letting me go through. Could it be that God is orchestrating your life, and that you are where you are, 
God's more concerned about where you're headed than where you've been. God's more concerned about where you're headed than where you've been. I love the story that was I just read recently about uh, Dr. Einstein, Albert Einstein. He got on a train. Got on a train, and he, when the ticket taker was coming down the road, he lost his ticket. He's searching in all his pockets. He even stands up as if he's sitting on it. The ticket taker comes up to Einstein and says, that's okay, Dr. Einstein. I know who you are. You don't worry about your ticket. He went on down the line to take up more tickets. And when he came back, Einstein is now on his knees looking underneath the seat to see if he can find his ticket. The ticket taker said, don't worry, I told you that I know who you are. Don't worry about that ticket. Einstein said this, I know who I am, but I need to find that ticket to find out where I'm going. <laughs> I love that story. Love that story. Where are you headed? Where are you headed? I'm going to close with two stories. Not, not in Scripture. We talked about these three stories and about, and about what we can learn. What was the first story about? God getting us where He really wants us to be. Maybe that's where you and I are. Second story, it's not you and me that, that does the, the good storytelling, the good preaching. It's God that moves people's hearts. And then this third story. God orchestrates some things to occur. Maybe He's working in your life Maybe he's working in your life and mine to be able to work through us to reach the lives of other people. Let me tell you two quick stories. Revelation is a book that tells you about what's going on now and what's going to happen in the future. Revelation says that you and I are involved in a constant war with the old rascal. Y'all are studying that on Wednesday nights, I think, and that's the last time I was here and you were studying it. And did you finish that study? Okay. You, you, you were studying Revelation. <laughs> Revelation is a book that tells you about what's in the future. Revelation says we are in constant war with the devil. Revelation says one day that war is going to be over. And when the smoke clears and the dust settles, people that are standing with Jesus are going to be victorious. Anybody in the room believe that? Appreciate your enthusiasm. Do you believe that? <laughs> Absolutely. We're going to be okay because we know the end of the story. Tom Mutter and I share a common love for the St. Louis Cardinals. If they're playing a game during church time, Tom doesn't want to know who's winning. And if the king gets over, he for sure, he wants to go home and watch that whole thing. It doesn't bother me to know my Cardinals win before the game is over. It doesn't bother Tom a great deal. But you and I know how this whole thing is going to end one day when the battle with the devil is over. We're going to be victorious. He was 15 years old, and he was wanting to be baptized. The preacher baptized him into Christ. The young man then said, I'd like to study the Bible with you. The preacher said, that's a good idea. Where do you want to study? He said, I want to study Revelation. The preacher thought, well, that's not where I'd usually start with a brand new Christian. But okay, if that's what you want to study. You go study Revelation for four weeks. Then come back and tell me what you learned. The young boy went, went away and came back four weeks. Did you study Revelation? Sure did. The preacher said, what did you learn? The young boy said, we win. He knew the end of the story that we win. That principle came home to my house a few months ago. Susan is my wife that's here today. We have a grandson named Drew who played baseball for Wright State University up in Ohio. Thanks to ESPN2, no, ESPN Plus, if we can get to go there to watch the games, they played his games on TV. So we'd get to see him play on, in, in our living room. A few months ago, he played in a game, went two for four, and his team won. I went to work the next day, came home from the office. Susan, my wife, said, as a good grandmother would, let's watch that game again. She would take it. <laughs> so we sat and watched that game again. Drew got on day. Drew had not got on base yet. He went two for four in the game, so he gets up to bat. He gets two strikes on him. I just keep eating my ice cream. One word a bit. Because what did I know? What did I know? He's going to get a hit. Later on in the game, his team got behind. I just kept eating my ice cream. Wasn't worried a bit. Because what did I know? We're going to win. You and I are both concerned about what's going on in our, in our world. You and I are both concerned about what's going on in our, in our own country. Don't know what's going to happen in two weeks. Maybe you're thinking, if, let's just get a Democrat in there. Let's get a Republican in there. Let me tell you something. The chair that matters the most is the chair that our Lord is sitting in. He's sitting on His throne and His will is being done. 
whatever happens in Nashville is less powerful than our God sitting on his throne. Whoever sits in the chair in Washington, the most important thing is, is God sitting on his throne. Do you believe that he is? Church, we're going to be okay. May not like my tax. May not like my price of gas. But because you and I know the end of the story, we're going to be okay. And the whole church said, Amen. 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 Let's rely upon that faith as we go forward, living for our Lord. Would you pray with me? Lord, we're thankful to know the end of the story. We are thankful to know that we're going to be okay and that you're sitting on your throne. And we're thankful still to know that the tomb is empty. Is empty. And we're thankful for our Lord and His resurrection. And may they give every one of us hope in spite of some things and because of some things. We're thankful that we can assemble in the quietness of this morning and focus our and refocus our minds on you. We thank you for Jesus. And we're thankful that we know things are going to be okay in our future. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Don't know where you are in your journey with God. Maybe you're ready to be baptized into Christ. Or maybe we can pray together as sons and daughters of God. Whatever the need might be, if the response is needful on your part, there's a wonderful time and opportunity. Would you stand together?